In uh, the uh, Department of Finance in the House of uh, Delegates, he is the vice chair. They call him Mr. Hardy down there. We call him John up here. How are you, sir? I'm good. Good Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to talk to everyone this morning. Great to have you with us. By the way, to close in our last segment with Delegate Height about the criminal negligence bill that we were talking about, Paul Espinosa, the Speaker Pro Tem, sent me HB 3401 on my phone. I can see he says legislation has been introduced and is pending in House Judiciary. And, and John, I would ask you, I, I don't know if you were aware of the lack of uh, a strong deterrence for those uh, committing criminal negligence. In this particular case, we were talking about the example of someone who speeds past a stopped school bus, mows down a six-year-old, and maybe might do might do six months in jail in West Virginia. And I'm baffled as to how that could have been possible for all these years until Matt Harvey, and I'm sure some others as well, have made a point of trying to change that law. Yeah, so I, I was not aware of that until I had a conversation with uh, with Matt there. Uh, I think we might have had a conversation about that before we came to Charleston, or maybe it was down here in the Capitol one day we had a conversation about that. And uh, so Matt does a real good job. He's he's down here quite often, and he is uh, – doing what he needs to be doing for his organizations. And uh, so we had that conversation, and uh, Delegate Espinosa came to me, oh, maybe two weeks ago or so, and with, with that piece of legislation and said, hey, I got this bill. Uh, we talked about it for a little bit, and I said, yeah, we, and we used the example of what had happened uh, on Route 9 to the young high school, uh, the, the young girl that went to Washington High School. And so we knew there was examples of this and, 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 and knew that uh, – uh, among other things that needs to change uh, with some of those traffic patterns, this was also something that needed to change to to stiffen those penalties a bit. John, we've got uh, a lot of stuff to get to. Uh, some of it's some pretty heavy lifting stuff. I want to start with some of the lighter things that might be easier to get through uh, first. And one of those is uh, allowing county councils to change their name to county commissions. This is HB 2630. I see it's pending in Gov.org. Can we please make sure this gets through this year? Uh, you know what? That sounds pretty easy, but I had a conversation yesterday with Governor Ward Council, and uh, that bill has gotten way down in the weeds, and uh, I'm not sure if that's going to happen this year on the House side. Uh, I'm trying to work with my Senate colleagues to try to do something over in the Senate. Uh, it's hit a few roadblocks here, and there's a um, – I will say there is a spirited difference of an opinion of what I think needs to happen to make that happen from what Council thinks – needs to happen to make that happen so can you, and i'll leave it at that can you give me an example of why anyone would have a problem with this i think constitutional amendment to change it and i called you know i said you know, bull butter but i mean it was a pretty spirited conversation <laughs> yesterday I, it's got a council person who is uh, just way down in the weeds and is just just going a little further than you know listen that's what they're paid to do they're lawyers that's what they're paid to do um but I would just say that they're just a little far down in the weeds on that and um, probably uh, over their skis a bit. So, But we'll, we're working through it. We'll see. I don't know if it's going to happen this year. I had a conversation with uh, Senator Barrett yesterday. We got, we got it introduced on the Senate side. Um, so we're going to try to bring it over from the Senate and bring it through a different committee over here and see if that works out. So we'll, we'll just see. Has the HB 3005 accelerating the conversion of the state excise tax on the privilege of transferring real property into a county excise tax, has that gotten caught up because we have to wait to see where the dust settles from the tax cut plans? Well, we just passed it out of House Finance yesterday, and it'll pass the House floor with ease. Uh, it's going to go to Senate Finance. Uh, we're, I'm brokering a deal, working, I wouldn't say brokering a deal, but working a piece of legislation um, with uh, the Senate Finance Chairman, on a piece of uh, legislation that he has uh, that the auditor has introduced and also the Secretary of State's interested in. So we may end up trying to marry those two pieces of legislation together. So uh, I'm not 100% sure that I um, am locked in with what the Senate wants to do. So I am I haven't committed, uh, but it's still a working process. I have a meeting with the council from uh, – uh, Secretary of State's office tomorrow to firm up exactly what the Secretary of State's office is trying to do to make sure that it will sync up with what I'm trying to do. So we're that is a deal that is um, that is still working and a piece of legislation that we're still working on. So probably we'll have a better update on that in about a week. 
Okay, we start to get into the heavier stuff now. I watched with great interest this past Friday the debate over form energy. Delegate Bill Ridenauer, very passionate uh, about his reasons why extending money toward a private enterprise was a bad idea. I saw you sitting beside the finance chairman, Bernard Chris, uh, talking uh, uh, with Bill and answering some of the questions he had uh, about the bill. Can you explain that situation to me as you were on the ground floor, sort of in the middle of it, because Bill was on one side and you were on, in the middle between Bill and the, and, the, and the Senate finance chairman, Vernon Chris. Or, sorry, the House finance well, yeah, chairman, Vernon Chris. I mean, yeah, I mean, I did all the work on that bill. I mean, I, I did I did the, the House work on that bill, and I did I defended that bill on the floor. I defended the amendments. I was... That was kind of one of my areas of responsibility, and I know that piece of legislation inside and out. So, and I would tell all the people who are coming out against it, they're they're grossly in, in, uh, misinformed. They have no idea what they're talking about. There's a <clears throat> a group of individuals in the Berkeley and Jefferson County area, and they're just grossly misinformed. I mean, they just don't understand. This is one of the best deals that West Virginia's ever cut. I mean, if you take and look at some of the deals, now listen, do. Is there people that disagree that the state government should be getting involved in private businesses, you know, and they would say we're picking economic winners and losers? And, and I say, you know, there's an argument for that. But I would also tell you that other states have made these investments. If you're going to grow your economy, if you're going to have economic development, then you are going to have to be involved in this type of deals and structure these type of deals. It's just the way it is. If we want to bury our heads in the sand, and watch all the other states pass us by through economic development deals because we're not putting our skin in the game and we're not, you know, helping with infrastructure costs and helping with these companies, you know, to, to make West Virginia um, uh, a place that they would want to come and do business and create jobs and create wealth, create economic development, create tax base, then that's, then that's the game that some people want to play. I would tell you that our economic development team has done a wonderful job. I trust them 100%. They've done a really good deal. Uh, they structured this deal in a way uh, than, better than any other deal we've ever been involved with, that this one was collateralized. Uh, we had literally uh, ownership of part of this. Any of the other deals that we've made with Nucor and any of the other um, companies, we had no collateralization in those deals at all. If they went bankrupt and belly up, they were gone, and all the money was gone. And we have a five-year collateralization plan in this in this deal. Um, and I think the, the reason why this deal it was just got so much attraction is because of the type of energy that it it doesn't even produce any energy. That was another thing. People were it said it's an anti coal bill, it's an anti gas bill. The, the, this company produces zero energy. This company produces batteries, which stores base energy. And what is base energy comprised of in West Virginia and most states? Coal and natural gas. So the people that are out. Um, that are just, you know, saying what a bad deal this is are so far over their skis. They don't understand the deal. They don't understand the structure of economic development. And I would tell them to go get themselves educated before they spew their hate on Facebook. And there has been uh, a good bit of vitriol over this, uh, especially as directed toward uh, many of you who are in favor of this bill on Facebook. Matt Harvey, go ahead. Is there any guarantees that they'll use West Virginia coal or natural gas, or just the proximity to West Virginia coal and natural gas, good enough? Well, use use the natural gas and coal in what what capacity? This this company doesn't produce energy. This company produces batteries. They build batteries. They build iron uh, rust air rust technology batteries. Now, there's going to be plenty of steel. They're going to need plenty of steel. They're going to need energy to energize their manufacturing. So yes, they'll use coal to energize their factories. They're not like the Berkshire Hathaway deal where they're building their own on-site solar panels to try to to try to try power some of that facility. I mean, that Ravenswood facility is building a solar panel array down there that will probably power about maybe 20% of what the energy uh, they will need, and it will all subsequently be uh, subsidized with coal energy and, and natural gas energy. Um, Form Energy will obviously use lots of energy for their production and to run their facility. That will be base load energy coming from West Virginia coal-fired power plants. So I, I just the, the, this is being against coal and being natural gas. The, the argument just doesn't stand doesn't stand up. So I'll I'll defend this vote and I would stand on anywheres and debate this with anybody that wanted to debate it with me and, and be able to explain exactly why I. Um, uh, stood in favor of the legislation and and uh, moving forward, uh, I think that we're going to see more deals uh, that's going to be coming out of our economic development um, uh, secretary's office. And I think the state of West Virginia 
Uh, it's going to have to get behind these deals if we're going to grow the economy in the state of West Virginia, keep our best and brightest, build our tax base, uh, and be able to change the way people live in the state of West Virginia, uh, having economic uh, diversity and being able to, um, uh, you know, have, what, what, what I think Ronald Reagan said, uh, the best social program there is is a good job. So I think if we're going to continue to move forward, then we're going to have to continue to keep looking at deals, uh, working with our economic development. Speaking of deals, Delegate Hardy, um, where are we at with taxes and tax reform in West Virginia? Well, I think it's working. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a process. And I will tell you that I have not been privy to those negotiations. Those negotiations are working at the highest levels of state government. Um, and I don't know exactly where we're at on the breakfast? deal. But you don't get to go to the Thursday pancake feed at the governor's mansion? No, no. Um, Delegate Hardy's not invited to those, and that's okay. Um, so, so, and sometimes it's nice to have plausible deniability. I, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what's going on because I don't know. So, but I think there's, uh, I think there's definitely um, uh, there's dialogue. There's dialogue. There's there, uh, the parties are talking, and um, so you know we only have three weeks left here. Um, do we get a tax deal done during the regular session? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that there's a possibility we could come out of here with a tax cut. Um, it's probably not going to be what the House wants. It's not going to be what the governor wants, and it's not going to be what the Senate wants. It's going to be a compromise, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, compromise in government is a good thing. I think some politicians have forgotten the art of compromise and or have lost the art of compromise, and it's uh, – become a real rigid process it's either my way or the highway and and uh so i think that uh, uh that that process is still working and it remains to be seen if it gets done in the regular session or are we coming back here and in a special session uh to wrap up that bow i'm just not sure but it's kind of got everything on, on a little bit of a kind of we're kind of in a holding pattern right now we haven't spent a lot of money we haven't really put together the back of our budget we we kind of have a a, a platform for our budget of what how the budget's going to look. It's not going to look a lot different from last year's budget. We know that uh, uh, the governor's proposed budget is going to be pretty close to what the front of the budget's going to look like. Now the back is is subject to plenty of change. Um, I'm sure that we're not going to spend all of the uh, money that the governor wanted to spend on some of his projects. But so it's it's a process, and like everything else, it'll come down to the to the 11th hour, and uh, we'll be scrambling to get it all put together. And, and, th- and that's pretty typical. But d- but do you <laughs> – is the House – from what I hear, and the House is willing to, to compromise. Do you think that that, um, that would extend to the governor as well? He's, he's willing to compromise? You know, I think the governor is willing. I think the governor is like any other, you know, um, businessman. He likes to cut a deal. He, you know, we, we all – I mean, that's I, I like to cut a deal. Everybody likes to, to get in a room with a couple people that you don't agree with and try to work and – come up with some type of com- compromise and cut a deal. So I think the governor has, has some room, some wiggle room. And I'm sure, you know, the House, we've we've done everything besides do backflips down through the well to try to get a tax cut. I mean, we were trying to get 15% two years ago, and, you know, it's proven, you know, um, that we could have done that two years ago and we would have been fine. So, I mean, the, the House is definitely on board, but I'm sure we're willing to no- negotiate to uh, at least get the ball rolling. Um, I'm not sure what other kind of provisos the Senate wants to put in there if they're going to want to do the the automobile um, personal property tax rebate. I'm not sure if if they're stuck on that. I mean, that's uh, you know, or, or maybe they'll maybe they'll move the Social Security to 100 percent, take the caps off. I'd be all in favor of that. Uh, maybe there was some talk about the marriage penalty, but I heard Ken Apple say on your all show the other day that. Really, what they were going to do with their marriage penalty really didn't do a whole lot. So, um, so I'm sure they're they're going to revisit that. So it, it, it's all up in the air right now, Matt. John Gilstrap, Delegate Hardy. Good morning. It sounds to me like we're pretty much abandoning the whole big splash approach to tax reform. Is that fair to say? Uh, it could be. I mean, like I said, I'm not involved in those negotiations, and I mean. I, you just don't know what's going to come out of it. We could see 15%, we could see 25%, or we could say, I mean, I wouldn't be, I, you just, you don't know. I mean, they could say, well, let's make a big splash, let's do 60% with, with tax shifting. I, 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 I haven't been privy to those conversations, and I don't really know which direction they're headed. And so, you know, I, I would not be surprised if we saw 
you know, something between 20 and 25 percent. And I would not be a surprise if we saw something over 50 percent with some tax shifting. So I, just, I really don't know where those negotiations are going. Do you sense there's an appetite for a incremental approach to this where whatever, assuming something comes out of, of this session, whether this session or special session gets through the governor's signature, that this is just the first step of an ongoing process, whether it's 15 or 25 or 50, whatever the numbers are, these, is there an appetite for this being a stepping stone and then in the next session Im- improve upon the, the tax reductions? I, I would certainly hope so, John. I mean, I, you know, I've always, and, and I've said this many, many times, I'm a huge fan of incremental politics, structure things in such a way that we can do them in steps. If we, you know, take a bite of the apple, and if that's good, then we can move and take a second bite of the apple, uh, you know, structure these things in steps with, with guardrails, uh, you know, even triggers. Now, I do get a little worried when we start talking about triggers uh, because uh, sometimes, um, you know, there could be um, – they could put triggers in that, that we couldn't meet, that they would just be unrealistic triggers. So you have to be careful sometimes when you set these triggers in some of this legislation that it's a – uh, a fair and obtainable measure that can be met. So, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I've always been a big fan of incremental politics and, and moving forward slowly. I mean, we did it with the excise tax bill and very fiscally responsible. It gave the money back slowly. It didn't really hurt the general revenue budget of the state. And so uh, I would hope to say that whatever we come out of here with, either out of our regular session or maybe a special session down the road, that it has some type of um, – uh, plan in in mind that we can uh, slowly you know and responsibly be able to advance that uh, formula what's the likelihood do you think that this this closet full of money the what what is up two billion dollars now in in excess funds starts burning a hole in the pocket and and there's a sense that it needs to be spent on programs as opposed to sending it back to the people well speak for everyone but i can tell you i'm fighting like hell down here to quit the not spending money um it does and I, i touched on this the last time I was on your radio show, and I probably upset a few people, but it does upset me that there is committees in the House that spend money um, very easily. I don't want to offend any drunken sailors, but they, they spend money very quickly and very easily, and they put all that on the backs of the Finance Committee to hold the line. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that my office is known as – uh, the office of heartbreak. You know, people come to see me and talk to me about their bills and their legislation, and it's my job to make sure that we have the fiscal node and the what the fiscal um, uh, responsibility of that piece of legislation is going to be. Uh, I, I talk to the chairman, and ultimately everything is the chairman's decision. The chairman works at the will and pleasure of the speaker. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, it's, it's my job to deliver the bad news. Um, I don't say that I take great joy in it, but, um, you know, it's kind of something that I'm okay with. So a lot of people come to my office and sit down and talk with me about legislation and leave here not happy with myself or maybe um, the outcome of their of their bills moving forward. So, But uh, I'm going to put a sign on my door. It says the uh, Office of Heartbreak. Be and if, prepared. And if nothing else, you have a new radio name, John Heartbreak. Johnny Heartbreak. Yes. Kind yeah, of goes yeah, with Heartbreak. Yeah, so, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. So it's... Uh, You know, I call this my office of solitude. My office, I have a really nice office. I'm not complaining. My my office is great. It's uh, out of the way. Uh, It's very quiet. It's a great office for working. It's not a very good office for uh, being able to talk to uh, other people as they're passing by. So sometimes I have to go out and peruse the East Wing to keep my sanity to have some people to talk to. Um, But, uh, yeah, a lot of people come here to, to, to work their legislation and, uh, and, and find out that this will be the final point that it's going to make it this year in the legislative session. <laughs> the final resting place. About 30 seconds left, be. John. Campus carry, do you see it becoming law this year or delayed until even another conversation next year? You know, I don't, I don't foresee it having any problems in the House. I'm pretty sure it'll pass the House. It, uh, I believe we passed it out of the House before and it went to the Senate and it died over there. Or got him. I'm not exactly sure what happened to it. I think it will pass the House. Uh, obviously, I'll be 100% uh, support of that piece of legislation. I don't think that your God-given right Second Amendment stop when you walk onto a college campus. And if the college campuses don't want to do the campus care, they don't want to abide by state law, then they can give up their state funding and become private entities, and they can do whatever they want. So um, 
my thought is that uh, you know a student or a faculty member or someone who has seconds. business on that college has that college campus has the ability to defend themselves and protect themselves. Delegate Hardy, thanks so much for your time this morning.